And it didn't take long. Just weeks after Harry and Meghan left our shores, the federal opposition has dusted off the prospect of Australia becoming a republic. That's 20 years after the last failed referendum. The Labor Party says it will hold a plebiscite on the issue in its first term, if it is indeed elected at the next election. This is our jumping off point for tonight's Taking Stock. We're joined by Shivani Gopal, CEO of The Remarkable Woman, and Chris Dion, Managing Partner at Stella Business Consulting. Uh, good evening to you both. Great to have you with us tonight. Um, look, support for a republic is said to be its lowest level in 25 years. Is it, is it madness to be bringing this up now? Yeah, it totally is. I, I think there are far more important things we as Australians should be worrying about right now than whether or not we should be a republic. And frankly, Australian politics has so much trouble choosing who their PM is going to be. So it's a pretty bad proxy, I think, <laughs> on, uh, on whether or not they'll be able to decide who the head of state will be. And if you take it a little bit further, have a look at the official website for the Australian Republic movement. They say that if they do go ahead with it, it'll be based on three key things. Wait for it. Fairness, equality, um, and, uh, and merit. Three key things that the Australian Parliament doesn't have. You've just got to look at the lack of women <laughs> under the guise of lack of merit. Mm. So I, th I think it is madness, yes. It's interesting, isn't it? It seems politically to be quite close to the top of the bag of tricks. You know, it seems to be occasionally it just gets brought out and waved around and then, and then just kind of put back in the box. Chris, what do you think? Is it Unbelievable. Crazy? Yeah. I mean, you sit there going $160 million and it's an election promise. Nothing else to worry about in our planet and in our country. I kind of go, it's a waste of time, money, potentially. Um, I was listening to an article from Geoffrey Archer who was talking about Brexit. And they were saying, now they've decided they might have another vote on Brexit. I'm sitting there going, but he said, look, you know, we've done this. We did this referendum in 99 and we got a no. And definition of lunacy, according to Einstein, is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting to be different. <laughs> So I'm just kind of sitting here going, there's got to be bigger fish to fry and to spend $160 million on. Mm. And I don't get it. And the point that you were just making in yeah. terms of the British monarchy may not bear much relevance to daily life in Australia, but at least they offer stability, which we just haven't had it at senior levels of government, have we? Interest sorry, interesting mm. point. I just read another article about the $368 million that's brought into the tourism economy from a marketing perspective. Like The, the, the royals have brought a lot of attention into this country so they're kind of revenue in and we're going to spend revenue out trying to work out we want to be with in partnership with them or not if we want to be part of their lives i just find it really weird it's yeah money, it's not it? just the money is it i mean so they're bringing all these tourism dollars and yes they have this stable hand but also they're talking about things that were previously taboo and are going to help millions of australians you've got harry will kate megan openly talking about mental illnesses we know that one in three people suffer from them i mean these are just facts we don't have aussie politicians going out there and talking about their everyday struggles with mental illness because they're worried about the knife in their back mm. uh, so the stability i think is a really good thing it's staggering to be talking about this so soon after that royal visit, isn't it? I mean, people were lining the streets. I don't think I've seen star power to that level in Australia. I mean, I don't even know when. Yeah. It, seems, it seems bizarre to be kind of following that with this conversation about departure from Left it field. all. Left field. And even if you don't understand that sentiment personally, to see it so strongly represented mm. in the community, then it is something that you can't ignore, isn't it? Yeah, it seems it's a little bit out of touch with the, with the, you know, with Australians. I mean, even majority of Greens voters are actually against a republic. So when you talk about being tone deaf and being out of touch, I think this is one prime example. Confusion reigns supreme when it comes to this topic. Um, look, there's another one that came across the desk today, uh, which is Uber Air. So we all are familiar with the concept of Uber by now, but now we're talking about it uh, taking to the skies. So you would be able to, uh, you know, as the kind of the promotion goes, you'd be able to look out your window and see people whizzing off here and there and everywhere um, in an Uber that is, you know, flying yeah. around. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable to be thinking that we could be arriving there fairly soon. Shivani, what do you think? I think that we're finally keeping up with Hollywood predictions. I mean, wasn't this fifth element? <laughs> you know, yeah, hello, true. Bruce Willis. <laughs> <laughs> What a, what a reference. I was not expecting that. <laughs> Look, I, I, I think for one, if you can get the safety kinks out of it, mm. I'm probably going to wait about three years. I'm not going to be the guinea pig. Um, but look, I, I think it's great. If you could get from the CBD to an airport in five minutes, or Melbourne especially, it's, uh, it's, it's notorious for just the traffic and the, and the amount of time it takes to get to and fro, it'll be great. At the same time, it'll probably be the new Uber Black, the, the very expensive mm. version. And there's going to be a lot of things that Uber Air is going to 
have to look out for. So right now you've got shoppers that can't actually go to and fro the CBD and the airport without observing certain routes. And that's because of the double bind that Uber Air is going to face. I mean, think about it. They will have to operationally you know, work in a sphere where there's high density, so they've got lots of demand for their services. And at the same time, if there's an accident, the amount of people that could be affected because of that very same high density is going to be quite scary. Once they get all that, all that out of the way, fifth element, here I come, <laughs> I'm on that thing. Yeah, absolutely. Chris, I'm in. <laughs> you're, you're in? Yeah. Well, I'm He's in because... in Melbourne or Sydney yes, peak hour. Yeah. <laughs> so I go to Melbourne every month right. and just waiting for the taxi queue and then waiting to get in the city for an hour and three quarters in peak hour is a nightmare. So I kind of, anything you can get me a little bit quicker mm. is fantastic. So the five minute trip is very exciting. I think the thing that's been overlooked though is the practicality of people hopping on another, hopping off a plane and getting onto something else. So I'm not sure whether they're going to be using drones, helicopters, they're using sort of light aircraft planes. But They've got to land them somewhere. So how's the airspace going to work? That's the first one. Yeah. And if you're in a real hurry, what do you do? Jump out and just parachute and I'm in, I'm in 303 you know, yeah. College Street, so uh, you just drop yourself down there. Or True. It, look, it's, I don't know how they're going to park the things and where a, they're going to park them. Look, it's a good point. I mean, technology and legislation in Australia has not always kind of been something that's gone on, you know, hand, hand in hand to say the least. Uh, I mean, I guess the question then becomes, well, if you do get all of this through and everything does work out in terms of the city and where you can do it and do it safely, what's a reasonable amount to pay? Um, because air travel is not a cheap thing. How far does it have to come down before it actually becomes, you know, bait for normal Australians? What do you think? I mean, a long, long way, a long way below what we're currently looking at for, for air travel? Yeah, look, I, I think it depends on the supply and demand, mm. of course. And I think what Uber Air is going to have to do is to is to make sure they've got a really strong following of an audience and uh, and so they can actually gauge a price point that will work because there's no point in pricing it where it's the new first class, for example. Mm. They're going to need to have enough demand to be able to, able to get this across you know, the, the line. Would I be prepared to spend um, a couple of hundred bucks, for example, to get from you know, Melbourne Airport, especially we keep picking on Melbourne because it is pretty bad, mm. um, you know, to the CBD in five minutes, I totally would because I'd be spending about, I don't know, 120 in traffic anyway. So I think it's all relative. Any more than that, I would really think twice and I probably wouldn't do it. Mm. I suppose, you know, speaking of Melbourne, continuing with, with Melbourne, one of the things... Melbourne. Picking on Melbourne, I mean, I'm Melbourne from Melbourne, Melbourne, I'm allowed yeah. to. Yeah, everybody. I forgot <laughs> that, yes, I, sh I should, you know, steer away. Yeah. Well, so, oh, look, this is the thing, though. It's, we talk about, um, Uber, Uber Air's talking about it, for, partially at least, from a commuter perspective. They're talking about, right, if you live in Geelong and you work in the CBD, mm. we can get you there in five minutes, uh, potentially. So, I mean, certainly a big... You know, a big potential there, surely, Chris. What do you think? Uh, absolutely. If, if they can somehow get the model right, so it's what I call mainstream, as opposed to elitist, mm. uh, and getting people in from the country. So I think Geelong, and if you look at the growth patterns in the western suburbs of Sydney now, and people come in, and I go down to, I drive down to Canberra because literally to fly to Canberra is long to, mm. as it is to drive, pretty mm. much from door to door, which is amazing, has been for years. But if you look at the Western Corridor and all of that growth through there, um, there are now people, you know, developers working out there and, and, and they're taking potential clients out there in choppers. And so I kind of go, if they can somehow turn that into mainstream, get people into the city. When I come past at 5.30 in the morning through the M5, it is literally a car park coming up the M5, mm. coming into mm. Sydney. And there's tradies there. So we're talking five in the morning, people are sitting in traffic for three hours. You know, that's got to be worth something to somebody if they can get in there a little bit quicker. I, th I think it's a great idea. Again, have it mainstream, have it commercialised a little bit where, where the average person could choose to do that if they wanted to. Yeah, I mean, On your point, Chris, think about the productivity boost that would happen oh. off the back of that. If you're mm -hmm. saving workers three hours each day in travel time, it'll be great for the economy. Problem with that is that you're not going to have time to put on your makeup in the car like you're doing now. So you've got to do it in the five minute trip. Mm. into the city, so I Take that. The, uh... Still sounds like science fiction to <laughs> <Yeah>. me. <laughs> Do you know what else is science fiction? The fact that people like Crocs again. Yes, this is, what? speaking mainstream, yes. this is not something we thought we'd be saying. Believe it. <laughs> <laughs> So, so this is off the back of uh, a recent survey around the, uh, over in the US that is saying that with teens and, and people in college, Crocs are back uh, from 27th to 13th when it comes to the most popular brands. Now, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but for a while now in Australia, Crocs have been seen to be a bit look, of a Look, I mean, when you see them on Drew Barrymore, they do look better than oh, on most yeah. people. This is true, it's but... A, she's quite blessed, isn't she? That's a very good point. Yeah, she can wear a pair of very Crocs like nobody's business, but um, I just don't think it's going to catch on. 
and I don't think it should. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> Look, I, I think the great thing about fashion is that you can celebrate and express your identity through what you choose to wear, which is great. I think it's fabulous that especially teenagers are choosing Crocs over heels, which are you know largely uncomfortable and, and largely unsafe for you. That being said, Crocs are awful. I, I think they look absolutely terrible. And let's think about some fashion disasters over the last couple of decades. There have been the mullets, there have been <laughs> the, the, the jumpsuits for men of the 1970s. Remember those, Chris? Absolutely. Those things went out and stayed out. <laughs> My Crocs DJ have gone out and come back in. Yeah, it's a yeah. phoenix. And if you, look at, if you look at fashion trends, and obviously I don't follow fashion trends, oh, I don't but know I would if that's say, obvious. Uh, come on. You just set them dressed by my mm. wife. Okay. okay. Um, the, the reality is that if, if you look at that, look, Dully, um, Dunlop volleys, they were big in the in the 80s. I used to play squash, run, I used to do everything, one pair of shoes. Mm. And then they went out of vogue and they all came back into vogue about 10, 15 years ago. And I think the Crocs are going to do the same. They've been revitalised by the social media, by the kids. It's, it's trendy again. And I think it'll trend up and it'll trend down and they'll find a plateau. I personally, not a big fan of Crocs. Sure. I had a pair. And by the way, everybody buys them to you at Christmas when you don't know what else to buy somebody. I think there's going to be a bit of that going on. <laughs> well, might, that might be the Christmas case uh, uh, this Christmas with them coming into fashion, but I thought it was interesting. Is that what you'd like me to get you, Chris? Would, would you mind? No, not I mean, <laughs> yeah. blue, please. Oh, uh, that's what, yeah. <laughs> um, no, I thought it was interesting that the CEO, Andrew Rees, um, went on the record and said, this isn't an accident, everybody. Yeah. Um, we were trying to get the yeah. teens and the college students. I mean, they went after uh, John Cena, the, the wrestler, big Huge. following in the US, and Drew Barrymore, as we saw there before. Uh, I mean, maybe this is a case of it's fantastic marketing, really good business strategy. Shivani, what do you think? It really is, and it also shows how important influencer marketing can be mm. for your business if you get it right. I mean, Rihanna wore it, which makes me think, did they pay her to wear it? Did they <laughs> send it out to her? Strategically, it worked because the moment Rihanna wore it, everyone was talking about it. Christopher Kane got his supermodels out there on the runway mm. with jewel-encrusted Crocs. <laughs> um, so, you know, if, if, if you're getting someone to talk about Crocs and you put some jewels on it, it certainly works, doesn't it? Um, um, and then, of course, yes, you had a whole, uh, Drew Barrymore and a whole mm. bunch of other influences that then had the teenagers picking it up. And, of course, the fashion trends are done by the young and the beautiful, right? Mm. And everyone else picks them up, which leads to you getting your Crocs for Christmas. That'd the blue nice. ones, of course. Yeah, well, as far as I'm nice. concerned, the only enduring footwear trend should be Ugg boots. I've never not had a pair of Ugg boots in my life. They're never out of fashion. Well, they're pretty comfy. They don't leave the house. As, but as anyway, Drew, Drew Barrymore can wear them for you and bring them straight back in. Absolutely. Chris, I don't final, need her validation. Final thoughts on the Crocs? Um, it's you. Not a fan. Not a fan. I'll <laughs> probably fill up some stockings. I do think it's a great marketing, what I call a repositioning strategy mm. of a product that just won't go away. Hmm. Like That's the Yugby. Love it. <laughs> 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 All right. Excellent. Shivani, Chris, thank you, thank you very much for joining us. It's always great to have you here on Taking Stock.